Chào mừng mọi người đến với lại cái event thứ hai của Việt Nam Tech Talent Network. Mình là Lan Anh, mình là phụ trách văn phòng Enver Việt Nam và uh, mình muốn chia sẻ một chút về cái Tech Talent Network mà bọn mình đang đang xây dựng. Thì uh, như mọi người biết, Enver là một cái tổ chức mà tập hợp hỗ trợ các doanh nhân để mà quy mô hóa công ty. Mình là một cái network mà những doanh nhân đi trước giúp doanh nhân đi sau và network này là toàn cầu. Ở Việt Nam thì bọn mình đã hoạt động được uh, gần 3 năm rồi và trong năm vừa rồi thì bọn mình nhìn thấy một cái nhu cầu rất là lớn phải um, giúp các công ty xây dựng cái capacity của cái team về công nghệ. Chính vì thế nên là cái, uh, cái network của Tech Talent ra đời thì là để làm gì? Bọn mình muốn tập hợp những cái tài năng về công nghệ lại với nhau để mọi người biết về nhau học hỏi từ nhau học hỏi từ các doanh nhân và biết được rằng là trên thị trường đang diễn ra những cái gì các công ty khởi nghiệp đang có những nhu cầu gì về nhân sự hay là đang cần tìm đang giải quyết những cái bài toán gì và mọi người có thể cùng nhau làm cái gì đấy là mục đích của Tech Learn Network thế thì hồi tháng 3 bọn mình đã tổ chức một cái event cũng hồi chùa lần đầu tiên và cũng được rất là nhiều người hưởng ứng vì đây là cái mà bọn mình đem được đến những cái diễn giả mà chia sẻ được với các bạn nhiều cái bài học kinh nghiệm. Chính vậy nên là hôm nay thì bọn mình mời được anh Thuận Phạm. Thì à, bọn người biết rồi, đã đọc về cuốn file của anh Thuận rồi. Anh Thuận là một à, huyền thoại ở trong à, làng Tích. Và trước đây anh Thuận làm Uber và bây giờ thì đang lead cái team Tech của Coupon. Thì mình sẽ không muốn nói nhiều nữa vì mình muốn giới thiệu anh Thuận và Linh. Linh là founder của Logivan. Linh hôm nay sẽ giúp uh, Tech Talent Network để moderate cái moderate cái buổi nói chuyện này. Thì uh, em mời anh Thuận và Linh bắt đầu luôn ạ. À, mình uh, chia sẻ sâu một chút là cái flow của mình như thế này. Uh, trong cái khoảng 30-40 phút đầu thì Linh sẽ trò chuyện đặt câu hỏi cho anh Thuận. Sau đó mọi người có thể đặt câu hỏi cho anh Thuận qua cái màn hình chat bất kỳ câu hỏi gì bọn mình và sau đấy Linh sẽ chọn để mà hỏi anh Thuận trên bọn mình sẽ có tổng cộng là 90 phút Thế, bây giờ xin mời Linh và anh Thuận ạ à, Vâng, em cảm ơn chị Lan Anh với introduction về Endeavor và Việt Nam Tech uh, Talent um, Bây giờ em sẽ switch uh, qua ngôn ngữ là tiếng Anh uh, để mà thuận tiện cho gọi là audience uh, hôm nay uh, của chúng ta Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for a fireside chat with uh, Anh Thuận. So my name is Ling and I'm the founder of Logivan, the truck hailing platform in Vietnam. So today I'll be moderating our chat and followed by open Q&A with uh, Anh Thuận. So you can type in your questions in the chat box so we can one of the largest and most exciting e-commerce companies in the world. It is known as the Amazon of South Korea. And recently in March 2021, Coupon has raised one of the biggest Asian IPOs since Alibaba's IPO. Only 10 years after the company was founded as a Groupon website in 2010. And before Coupon, Ang Thuận was also the chief technology officer at Uber, where he grew the technology team, the tech platforms and services company worth over $100 billion. All of that over his seven year tenure. And before Uber, he spent eight years at VMware, the pioneer of server virtualization technology that revolutionized IT and computing, where he led the engineering team of the virtual center and cloud management platform. Enquet holds a master in computer science and engineering from MIT. So now let's get started. Enquet, let's talk about your incredible journey from being an engineer to a CTO managing over 4,000 engineers at Uber. Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, though, um, thank you for the introduction, uh, Lynn, um, and congratulations on uh, your continued success with Logic Van. I remember seeing uh, meeting you for the first time four years ago when you just launched the company, and uh, it's very pleasing uh, and impressive to actually see it continue to to do very very well and growing. Um, there has to be a tremendous amount of uh, smartness and uh, and grit and perseverance that goes into building a company like that for such a young founders uh, like you. So uh, congratulations, and uh, I wish you continued Thank success. You. Thank you very much. Okay, so now what would you like to talk about? So let's talk about your journey, uh, being from an engineer to uh, being a, a CTO that managed over 4,000 engineers at Uber. How did that happen? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, it, it happened with uh, an epiphany uh, long ago uh, when um, when I was working as just an, as an engineer in the mid 1990 at a company, a very hot company at the time called Silicon Graphics. Um, we were literally inventing the future of build, uh, building a technology um, called interactive TV, which is the precursor of what we enjoy in the internet today. We had implemented uh, for a um, set of trial customer um, features such as video on demand, online interactive gaming, online shopping, et cetera, everything that we take for granted uh, today in the internet. But remember, this is the time, the time before uh, the browser became you know, available to, to, to the public. So there was no internet as we know it today. Uh, and yet in a uh, private um, uh, deployment, we can totally do this for mm. 4,000 uh, customers um, in that trial in, in Florida, as well as another trial in, uh, in um, Tokyo, Japan. And so um, that, that pr project was a uh, technical marvel, but unfortunately it was a colossal commercial failure. Okay, and wow. so, uh, but you know, the, the really interesting thing is uh, what I got out of that project was an insight. At the end of that um, um, project, when, when that division was about to fold, I, I, I asked myself, okay, what, what happened here? Um, we did something really amazing, but how come it didn't work? And uh, then I realized that the, the business matters a lot more than the technology. You can have the most wonderful technology in the world, but if you don't, um, address the, the business fundamental, which is uh, price. Um, you can have all the wonderful feature too, well ahead of its time, but if it's too expensive for the user, it wouldn't work. So you have to always prioritize the business before the technology. So that's one. The other epiphany is as an engineer, I gave that team and that project my heart and soul for wow. 15, 18 hours a day for the whole year. And, uh, and in the end, I only... Uh, even though I won an award for the second best engineer in that division for the superstar, uh, it didn't matter. I, I was just one portion of a much larger project. Um, nice. And so my epiphany was um, the person who I thought had the most impact on that project was the head of engineering. I don't know how he did it at the time, but he was able to grow an engineering team uh, somehow, magically, voodoo magic, the way I you know, naively thought. Um, mm -hmm. For some reason, he created an environment where we we gave it everything we've got. Uh, I remember I got married that year, and I forgo my honeymoon to go back to work on a Monday, right? Oh, and so, amazing. and and that was. But but how did he create that environment? I don't know, and I would never know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, it was such an inspiring thing for me that from that moment on, uh, that be, that goal became my north star. How do I acquire that skill over my career to be able to lead a large, world-class, talented engineering organization mm. to do very impactful thing? Because the limit of each individual is pretty small, but uh, the impact of a collective can be enormous. But then you have to have the skill to be able to organize and leverage and uh, all, all and harness all of that capability. Um, and so, so that was the epiphany that led me to the management job. And then the, the, then the hard part was a 20 year journey to, to get there. And if you're yeah. interested, I can go into the process of that. Um, so the process is I had to lay down, okay, what does it take for me to go from here to there? And roughly speaking, um, you have to become the team lead, right? But in order to become a team lead, you have to have the, the technical ability that other people respect. And then you have to start developing organizational and leadership skill to be able to coordinate and lead the work of others. And then if you succeed at that, you become a manager, then for the first time, you are now officially responsible for other people's success. And then you have to really care for them and their success is your success, et cetera. And then when you get to, and you're successful at that, then you get to a director level, a job, where um, now you have to learn the skill to be able to lead a multi-level organization where you don't know some of the people. And eventually when you get to VP, you don't know most of the people you manage. And yet somehow right. yes. you have to be able to navigate and inspire and, and channel everyone. Um, uh, and then of course, you know, at the executive level, uh, you have to um, have the re executive responsibility and accountability where everything is your fault. And the buck stop had to stop with you. You have to take full responsibility for everything your team does, sure. whether you have anything to do with it or not. Right. So all those things have to be learned in layer and layer 
so that's what it takes to in terms of the process to get there. Uh, and then there's a matter of what what path do you choose to get there. And the really interesting thing for me, uh, maybe it's insightful for the audience here, is um, when I was 27 years old at the time, uh, I went to my director at SGI and I said, um, oh, um, I really am inspired by the leader. I want to learn the management trade. You know, I, uh, I want to get onto the management, 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 management track. So he told me, he told me that, no, you're too talented of an engineer. I would rather see you on a technical track and become a principal scientist here than mm, the management Interesting. Track. Mm. I walk away from that meeting knowing I will quit and I quit two weeks later, right? And then the key two thing weeks. is if you know what you want, and the path isn't available for you and management or leadership isn't aligned with your goals and ambition, you have to beat your own path to find your way um, because you can't just you know, leave your uh, destiny in the hands of others. And so, so that sure. was the first time as a kid, I took charge of what path I, 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 I wanna make. And then, so that led me to quit um, um, SGI, which is one of the hottest company in the Valley at the time. And then I joined a very small startup. I was the fourth engineer. And that uh, small startup uh, worked on internet advertising. It's called NetGravity. It went public and then it merged with DoubleClick and then DoubleClick later on got bought by Google. Um, and um, because it's a small company and you join early and you work really hard, I was able to progress all the way through all those steps that I laid out. So I became a nice. team lead for nice. a couple of years and then a manager and a director and then a VP. And then at the end of that, the dot uh, com bust happened and then at the VP, I was a new VP, so my pat, my growth will be stagnated anyway for the number of years. So I quit that mm -hmm. and I joined a four person startup that is very, very cash poor. And uh, to prove to myself more, mostly whether I can actually uh, build something from nothing as an executive, not as an engineer. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did that yeah. and uh, three years later, that company folded, uh, but I had managed to build a team from practically nothing um, and uh, build a product. And so that experience, uh, even though the company wasn't a commercial set, but it didn't matter, you gain uh, some knowledge and some skill out of that. And then I enter VMware. Uh, and then I, yeah, I, got a, I enjoy a um, eight years ride when VMware also became very big and you, I get to learn um, a lot of things. Uh, I like to try a lot of things about my management uh, principles and philosophy at, at the VMware environment. Um, I also um, was tested because no, no company is perfect, you know. So uh, I was tested to the depth of my resilience because of you know organizational challenges and all that kind of stuff. But all of those uh, battle scar um, end up preparing me well for the the, the entry to Uber. Um, now you know people look at me and say, "Oh, Thanks. how did you?" Um, you become very famous or whatever it is because you enter Uber. Mm. Um, but the, the cautionary tale is, is it, it doesn't matter how you enter a company. Uh, I only become well-known because mm. Uber succeeded. If Uber didn't succeed, exactly. I would be just another uh, an engineering executive among thousands in the Valley, right? So, exactly. so it, um, mm. yeah, it, um, the, the position and the title we hold isn't that all important. What we do with it, it is very important. And so, um, you know, so that was my my journey, and the uh, the the moral of this whole story is that um, in, in your career journey and your life journey, um, there will be all kinds of challenges, roadblock, obstacle. Uh, you just have to be nimble, creative, and be fearless you know, to overcome those obstacles and and beat your way to success the way you want it, and then so and on your own term. So that's um that's the summary of mm. that. Wow, this is like incredibly um, inspiring already. And um, so the top three lessons that you've learned, right? The first one is that the business uh, before technology. And the second is to take matters, take your destiny in your own hands and be fearless. And the third one that I've learned here is, and also uh, your journey that you've learned is that you have to uh, be res uh, responsible and have to own your mistakes and faults. Everything is, stops at you and ends at you. And so uh, you have also taken another step uh, with your recent um, journey and you recently joined Coupon. So now you're leading a team uh, with more than a thousand engineers. And what are the biggest challenges that you face when you move to Coupon? Well, um, every company is entirely different from all the other companies, uh, from the culture, from the way it operates, um, uh, from the people. Uh, so 
uh, you just have to be very open-minded and, uh, and uh, prepared. Um, so mm -hmm. in fact, I, I, I like change. If you look at my career, I change a lot. Whenever um, I don't grow anymore or I get bored, that's not the best use of my time. I just switched and I would take more risks and I would join smaller company, different company. And I never joined the same company in the same industry, a uh, company in the same industry because it's too boring. Why do the same thing twice, right? Learn new sure. things. If you're going to mm -hmm. fail, that's great. You have new battle scars and you have new learnings anyway. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, um, but the best difference, uh, of going from one company to another, especially into coupon, is you have new problem to solve. Entirely new mm -hmm. domain. I have grown up solving internet advertising problem, interactive media problem, even uh, computing infrastructure problem, um, internet advertising, uh, and um, you know consumer um, um, you know uh, platforms like Uber, where you know mobilities and all of that. And I've never done e-commerce. So here's an opportunity to actually expose yourself to a whole new set of problem to solve, which is super interesting. Make your brain cell grow, make you a little scared, but it's all part of uh, uh, growth anyway. So that's, uh, and then you, you get to make new friends. You always get to make new friends and, and build yep. new relationship, which is really, really wonderful. So your network of people that you, you really admire, respect and care for, just keep on growing. And so, and then um, and another rule of thumb I use is when I go into companies, um, you know, don't assume that you come in and you have all the answers, no matter how accomplished you are, no matter how experienced you are, uh, you got to be absolutely humble. Uh, and I have a phrase that I use to remind myself all the time, you've got to respect the history. Every company mm -hmm. has challenges, but the challenges you face coming in um, is good because if the company has no problem, you wouldn't be hired in the first place to help solve any of it. Right? So you, yep. when you come in, you expect to come in to solve some problem. But the, the most important thing is you have to respect the history. You have to really dig in and understand how things got there. And in, I've seen many sure. failed leader comes in, guns blazing, chest thumping, and say, wow, I'm really smart. I've done this. I know it. And I look at the thing, and they just uh, prescribe solution. And it turns out mm -hmm. that those are just Band-Aid. They, they don't really understand the root cause of it. Right, they they would they might you know, put out that fire, but something else will be uh, springing up anyway. So you really got to dig in, understand the root cause of that, and then work with the people around you in that company who have their history, who have mm -hmm. the context, uh, to really solve the problem for real. And to do that takes a huge amount of uh, humility, right? That you you have to restrain yourself and just view that all the experience that you have are basically the the tools and. Um, that you collected in, in your bags of tricks. And then whatever mm. tool you pull out of that bags of tricks to use is dependent on the situation. And, uh, and to figure out what tool you need to use, you have to really understand that situation, right? And so respecting history is a very, very important thing. Um, so so that's, uh, that's what I find um, really interesting about Coupon. And in terms of the, 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 the challenges of Coupon, um, you know, uh, is uh, it has been very, very successful at delivering um, amazing customer service and speeder delivery and, and, uh, and the type of product offering. But because it's done that for quite some time, uh, it accumulated a fair amount of uh, technical debt, organizational mm -hmm. debt. Uh, and debt. let's be clear, yeah. some amount of debt is very health healthy anyway. Right? We all carry some debt because with that, you get speed to market, you get to you know, compress time. Uh, and however, um, debt has to be managed properly, that you have to pay down the debt, you have to strategically make the right call at the right time uh, so that you can retire some of the debt in order to continue to act, um, enable you to execute well, uh, as well as mm -hmm. uh, giving you, you some headroom to accumulate new debt in order to grow faster in some other area. So my job um, has, and the challenge has been how to, do, how to basically make sense out of all that and how to work with my leadership team to up levels our capabilities uh, from area of talents, vision, process, tooling, infrastructure, et cetera, uh, to enable all of us to, um, to be even more effective and move even faster to deliver more for the business. So it's not about just the speed, it's about the throughput of what you can deliver as a team. And throughput doesn't happen if you have a whole bunch of disparate teams just kind of scrambling and run fast wherever they are in all the different directions that sometimes they cancel each other out. Um, some amount of that is healthy, but the, the yeah. right amount of infrastructure platform building is necessary to enable company to grow well at scale.
Wow, nice. So when you moved to Coupang, right, the challenges were technical debts, and then you helped the team to clean up those debts and move at a faster speed and throughput and innovation as well. So let's talk a bit about innovation in Coupang, right? So um, it seems like it's grown tremendously um, due to bold decisions and investments in logistics and technology. So could you share with us on how your team is using technology to innovate in such a complex field such as logistics here? Yeah, sure. Um, let's, let's be clear. I mean, the Coupon, as well as many other companies that are very successful, um, they're very successful not primarily because of the technology. Right? Technology is secondary. Technology is a tool. Mm. They're successful because they deliver what customers really want. So at, at Coupon, the thing that I, I was uh, amazing to me when I talked to the founder over the summer before I even thought about uh, uh, joining uh, was the, the, the innovation of uh, dawn delivery. When you yeah. order before midnight and then you go to bed, you wake up, the thing that you order you know, is right in front of your door uh, within a matter mm -hmm. of hours like that. I thought that was an eye-opening type of innovation where it kind of break up, break up um, all the trade, all the normal trade-off that you can imagine, right? Oh, sure. Speedy times mm -hmm. and all of that. Uh, so, yeah. So I, I, uh, it's it's experience like that that you deliver that make the company love the product and the service. And then you know, of course, we use technology to make such a thing possible. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And in of course, if you if you think about it, the technology is is, is really cool. But um, when you want to break down to it, it's actually you know very logical. Right? In the fulfillment center, mm -hmm. in the log logistic change, um, you mm -hmm. have um, applications and services that allow uh, people, uh, our, our uh, employee, to um, basically pick, pack, manage inventory, uh, store, transport, and ultimately make delivery. Uh, and of course, we use. Um, um, a lot of data science in order to analyze the entire um, logistic chain to find out where the bottlenecks are, where we can improve, and we constantly tune it in order to make it better and faster and more efficient. We use a fair amount of robotic to assist our employees right. anyway in the logistics center from automatic mm -hmm. conveyor belt to route and sort packages to even uh, put labels and, and, and into bags and stuff like that. So um, a lot of that actually help us um, gain a lot of efficiency in order to be able to deliver more value for our, uh, our customer. So the, the technology basically is used to enable all of that. And it's really, really cool to kind of go in and, and see all of that at work. And, um, mm. uh, and you know, but just like everything else, when you break down to just the, the basic, the technology is, um, you know, pretty uh, straightforward, but how you put it all together to build an amazing business and service that a customer love, that's the hard part. How do you continue to maintain that obsession toward the customer experience? That's the thing that actually you know, uh, makes companies successful. For sure. And I can see that uh, for Coupon, you already have more than 137 patents registered. So that is a huge amount of innovation right there. And you certainly, broke the trade-offs between price, choice, and flexibility. Yep. And that is yep. amazing for consumers like us. And we wish that we would be able in Vietnam to have a coupon service uh, you know, to us right now. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see what the future will hold for us. So uh, another thing well, is um, <laughs> Coupon has multiple you know, business lines. And uh, mm -hmm. this is a uh, interesting um, the data that we just saw. Uh, recently, we looked at in the App Store for both the iOS and the Android App Store in Korea market. The three of the top five apps are coupon apps. So wow. there's a coupon okay. uh, commerce app, the coupon eats app, and the coupon uh, play, which is the streaming uh, movie app. So uh, mm -hmm. it's um, it says something when you deliver the kind of product that customer really want to get that kind of popularity. And um, yeah, it all start and ends with being obsessive about you know, customer experience and how to serve them. Nice. So now you're building an ecosystem uh, around coupon with the coupon play and uh, logistics and finance and other products. So what kind of product would you like to build next in the future? Well, um, I'm sure at Coupon here, we're going to keep on finding new product lines to, to launch and build. So uh, we will see what the future holds. Um, but personally, um, and, and whatever you know, business uh, opportunity and challenge to come up, you know, we will 
we will muscle up our engineering resource and capability to do that. But personally, philosophically, uh, again, you know, I, um, I'm open to, to many things. For example, you know, there's so many wonderful products being built all over the world by all kinds of companies anyway. Right? So uh, when I look toward the future, uh, what I gravitate to are not necessarily specific product because I don't have a bias toward one or against another. It's always around uh, what type of challenges that are big and meaningful uh, that I can apply in my time and, and, and my knowledge to help solve. And, uh, and so whether, you know, so I went from uh, transportation to uh, e-commerce and who knows what next, right? So uh, yeah, but, it, but it, uh, it's not about uh, chasing after technology or product trend because those things change so rapidly anyway, right? But chasing sure. after impact uh, and then usefulness. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. And that I, I never think too much ahead about the future. I think about uh, the near future, about what I can do. Uh, and then, um, you know, when, uh, when things wind down, you know, something else will just come up. So we'll see. Well, yes, so certainly uh, right now you're achieving a lot of uh, impact with Coupon and previously with Uber. So I cannot imagine what in, is in store for you. Um, so let me ask a little bit more about moving from a larger company to a smaller one, um, like a startup, for example, that you mentioned you joined in when there was just four people and you were the fourth um, person. So what should be kept in mind in terms of uh, technology? Yeah, so when you go from a large company uh, to a uh, smaller one or a very small one, um, what you will miss is uh, all the cool, um, nice tools and comfort that you have from, from yep. a company that, um, that has uh, the resources to actually build those things. Uh, so uh, I, many of my colleagues who went from Google or Facebook into Uber in the early days miss what they had at their previous employee. And many of the people who go from Uber to another stuff would miss what Uber has. And so it, it's always like that. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, you know, uh, when, you, uh, when you go into a smaller company, you have to know what to expect and uh, that you have to have the right mindset. And the right mindset is to just to be versatile and nimble with that I can do anything mentality because most likely you can have to do all kinds of things. Uh, you be a jack of all trade in order to do whatever it takes to help a some, uh, small company grow and, and succeed. Uh, you grew the company from scratch, you know what it takes, right? So, and then what kind of um, personality and, and um, mindset required to succeed in a small company like that. Um, and, and then um, you have to um, have follow a certain set of uh, um, principle. For example, in a smaller company, because you don't have enough resources, you try not to build too many things that you don't have to. Okay, so anything that you can leverage, you know, take it. Open source cloud computing, whatever it is you take. So you don't have to build those basic building blocks yourself so that you can Got focus it. your precious, precious resources and time building the business logic to actually deliver the product that your customer love. Yeah. Uh, and then as you continue to get more and more success, uh, you end up having more resources. And then based on that, then you can start maybe to build a few things that are very unique to to what you, um, uh, your, your company needs. So I have a little mantra that I share with my team all the time. Uh, first, you gotta make it work. By hook or by crook, you gotta make it work. Then you make it scale. And only then do you make it cheap and efficient. So, and most companies don't right. even get to the third stage for another 10 years or so, right? Because you, you try to make it work and then you, when whatever work you try to scale it and grow the business, and then you keep on iterating between those two phases until you get you know, pretty large and successful. Um, and so, so those are sort of the, the, uh, the, the principle at which um, it requires to be successful as a small company. Um, certainly be prepared to give up the comfort that you, you, you have at, um, at small, at large company. And that's actually a good mm -hmm. thing. Uh, I think comfort is a, it's a pretty dangerous thing in my book. Comfort lead to mm -hmm. um, uh, complacency uh, and it lead to uh, complacency, complacency lead to atrophy. So, uh, yeah. you know, when you push yourself all the time, that's when you get stronger and better and faster. Mm -hmm. uh, when you start slowing down because there's so many things around you uh, that are automated and oh. it's available to you, you don't have to work all that hard. Uh, you don't have to think all that hard. Um, then all of a sudden you become a little slower. So that's why, you know, whenever things slow down too much for me, 
um, I'd rather, you know, do something else. Mm. Wow, that is incredibly insightful. Um, so how do you keep updated with the latest uh, tech trends? Uh, what are the, your top resources, your go-to resources? Okay, so my top go-to resources are my friends. Uh, my friends who are at the you know, top yep. tier of the technical ladders. Uh, some mm -hmm. of them are uh, working with me right here at Kufang, uh, where I meet with them on a weekly basis and personally one-on-one -on -one every two weeks. So I'm on top of all the things that they're thinking about. And because they're very, very senior architect level engineer, they think a lot about technology and business at the same time. And so I feel like every time I talk to them as a group or as individual, um, I learn a ton and I grow new brains out just by you know, being in their present and, and have these conversations with them. Uh, and beyond that, uh, I also um, have my network of um, top technical talents and friends from past companies that are all over the valley. So whenever mm -hmm. I need to know about something, uh, I would call them up and chat. And in a very uh, short amount of time, I would um, learn all that I needed to know about whatever technology trend that, I, that, that might matter to what I need to, uh, um, to, to the problem I need to solve. And so uh, once again, you know, I don't primarily chase technology trend because technology mm -hmm. trend will also come and go. Um, uh, I basically would look at whatever technology a trend that is actually most relevant to the problem I have to solve at hand. And then based on that, uh, whatever I need to know, for example, about machine learnings, about stream processing, or so whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, I would call the right friends and, uh, and get yeah, up to date pretty quickly on those. Okay, so that is uh, relying on your uh, circle. So how do you build those um, kind of like uh, circles in the first place? Because, uh, you know, right now in Vietnam, we are uh, hosting and uh, trying to build a Vietnam tech talent network. Yeah, there, there are, um, and for, for me, because I've been around such a long time uh, that I, I know so many people in, in the tech industry, but there are um, more efficient way for uh, people to do that. Uh, for example, there are lots of, um, uh, special interest group uh, within every technology field anyway, right? If, if, you're, if you're like, for example, Apache Hadoop, there's a whole community for that. If you're like, you know, um, machine learning, there's a whole new community for that. This all over the internet. You basically subscribe mm. to whatever uh, group it is and then uh, get to know all the people there and network and, and learn from them. Um, so it's, it's not all that hard. Um, and uh, they are trade groups, they are conferences, um, the, yeah, uh, there are tech talks, there are, um, you know, all, all of these gathering that you have to just subscribe and, um, uh, and, and, and learn from one another and then build these, these professional network, you know, but even before the internet, make it super, super easy. Back then, when mm -hmm. you go to conferences, they all, all these birth of the feathers group, right, where people with a certain special interest in the subfield for that particular mm -hmm. topic will get together and then they exchange contacts and, and build relationship and, and start to build your network. So it's, um, it's a network that is very intelligent, right? So, um, because none of us know everything. Uh, and so, but, and these days, LinkedIn also make it super, super easy to discover people yes. as well. Uh, so, you know, there, there, there are many ways to do that. You just have to be uh, a bit resourceful. Exactly, so be resourceful, get yourself out there, connect with uh, like-minded uh, technology groups, and also to um, really uh, dig deep into what business problems that companies are facing and how you can help with that. Very yeah. interesting. So um, thank you for sharing about your uh, journey so far. And I'm sure this is incredibly inspiring to the young uh, engineers and entrepreneurs out there. So let's shift a little bit more about uh, engineering culture and leadership. So how do you uh, define a good culture for a company? Well, uh, every company has its own culture and its own feel. Uh, and um, let me also make a, a, a meta point here. Uh, culture is a collective behavior by a group of people. Uh, and uh, if, if you're not intentionally defining the culture, uh, you're gonna get a culture anyway, and it might not be the one that you like, right? So, uh, sure. so it, it's very, very important to be very intentional about uh, defining what culture you want for your company, mm -hmm. especially as a founder. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you, 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 you have that for, for your company as well. So if you look at um, um, 
many companies that I've been with, for example, Uber has 14 cultural value in the early days. Uh, and Coupon has 15 leadership principle, and everybody knows about the Netflix culture by reading the, the, the very famous uh, deck on uh, freedom and responsibility, right? So that is all of these. And um, what's really important isn't what's written on paper, but it's how you practice it, okay? Mm -hmm. How you actually work uh, those uh, cultures, values, principle into everything that you do. So your behavior as individual, as team, as a company, uh, embody those values all the time, most consistently. And so at, uh, at Uber, at the Coupon, where I personally um, you know, uh, get to see this, it's worked into the conversation. We cite cultural value in our conversation uh, with each other. Nice. Uh, we nice. Um, have interview module where we have to cover not only the, the technical capability uh, and, uh, and business acumen of the candidate, but also the, the, the cultural alignment uh, as well. And then we, we yes. have all these, uh, you know, uh, cultural value, we, we recommend to groups and a interviewer is assigned to what that one particular group to check out several of those cultural values. Uh, and uh, so we have to actually want uh, for those companies to succeed and to continue to attract people who share those same value. Um, you, you have to be very rigorous about, you know, screening for it um, and also enforcing it. Uh, what, what, mm. what I mean by that is when you see someone behave in a way that are counter to your value, you have to step in and, and course correct that. And you share, yep. tell that person that's not okay, right? Um, culture is about what, what you're willing to, to live uh, and set uh, uh, forth, but also enforce as well. Okay, so, uh, so that's, that's a very important thing. Mm, very important to uh, preach it. Um, so it's like culture, it's strategy for breakfast, right? So how do you keep doubling down in uh, your into your efforts in building the culture, as in like improving the culture to align it with the what you write on paper all the time? Could you share more specific examples? Yeah, um, for example, uh, so at, at the, at the company-wide, you know, there are these leadership principles, which I share with you all that, uh, we, uh, we live by those value, okay? And then when we make decision, we cite the reason when we make those decisions that are aligned with those values. We make the decision because it fits this cultural value, okay? Uh, all that. And then within the engineering organization that I'm responsible for, uh, I also added some uh, additional thing um, on, on top of the, the cultural value that it applied company-wide. And the value mm -hmm. that I espouse in my engineering team, uh, starting with the leadership team and, and cascading downward, uh, one of selflessness, where we view ourselves as being here to serve others. We put our com customer and our company first, our team second, and ourselves last, right? So that kind right. of uh, mindset will cause us to, to optimize for the business. Uh, so mm -hmm. that, you know, and then that aligned with the company-wide uh, value of, you know, that um, have a company-wide perspective, for example, right? And also customer obsession. All of those things are very aligned, but you enforce it more at the local level now, and, and on top of the, uh, the, the company value. The second one um, that I uh, value within engineering team culture is uh, teamwork because everything we do is very, very complex. And I don't want to see cases where people work against one another. Uh, I want to see people put aside differences and prioritize for the company and customer and actually work together and get things done. Uh, and of course, you know, the third value mm -hmm. is really important to me is uh, kindness. It matters a lot, right? I, I, I wanna create an environment where uh, I love to show up to work every day, right? And, yeah. and, and for that is I just love to work with, you know, nice, kind people. And uh, we don't have any, uh, we have a very short fuse toward people who, who don't live by those value. Uh, and even at my previous company, I even fired a, a VP of engineering for wow. having aggressive behavior and bully colleagues. Uh, and so like right. that is this zero tolerance for that kind of thing. So, um, and then when you, um, like I said before, having a, a value, meaning that you have to be willing to live by those values, and you have to be willing to make very tough decisions to enforce those values. Um, and so, mm. you know, so that, that's how I, um, I do that. In terms of how you keep on improving the engine culture, um, you have to measure it because you can't improve it yep. if you don't really measure it. So uh, we have systematic way, both at my previous company as well as the current company, to uh, survey our employee uh, satisfaction every six months. There's a variety of questions. 
And yeah. uh, when we get nice. the, the result of the survey, uh, we see where we score high, we see where we score low. And uh, my approach has always been take the three lowest scoring points, understand and mm. dig deep and understand what caused it, and then implement program to uh, improve it. And then measure again in six months to see what you did it actually is, you know, was, uh, um, uh, has, has an effect. And, and then of course, uh, if you keep on doing it right, the bottom three no longer become the bottom three because it improved and then something else will be the bottom three. And you <laughs> yeah. keep on doing that. And over yeah. the course of several years, you continue to improve mm. the culture. Uh, like that's a saying that you don't, um, uh, you can't improve uh, what you don't measure. So you got to measure first and then you figure out what's the problem are, and then you got to figure out how to solve it and measure it again. Mm. Yep. Mm. So you use the uh, employee uh, net promoter score to measure the health of the culture, the satisfaction of the company of the employees. Yeah, it, it's not just the NPS score. The NPS score is just one score. We actually mm -hmm. have dozens of questions and depends All on right. how they answer that question. And then we actually uh, mm. look at the, the score per team, per organization, per location, per job level, all that stuff, we slice and dice all kinds of uh, things, our tenures at the company, so that we can see what population of the company thinks a certain way and feel a certain way. Mm. And based on that uh, type of knowledge and data, then we will be able to um, uh, triangulate and figure out what are the issues there, right? Uh, and then of course, we, if we need to, we'll dig in further and we go back and we will survey specifically some, some set of people to understand from their perspective, you know, what happened to those area. So, so that's, that's how you sort of measure uh, the culture. And then there are other things that are a little bit more vague, uh, such as uh, how do you measure engagement, right? Um, so mm -hmm. how do you feel that? So for example, if you have a, um, the survey itself, if the engagement is 50%, it's pretty terrible. That means half of the people don't care. Right, that means you got a problem there. Uh, if uh, I'm used to having a very high engagement um, a workforce in the past company where uh, high 80% or low 90% uh, people respond, wow. that means everybody care to give the feedback. Uh, and then mm -hmm. you also measure uh, whether or not there are churns and attritions out, out of a particular team that might indicate something, some issue with yeah. that team dynamics or mm -hmm. the manager, the leader of that, that area, et cetera, or attrition out of the company. That means something is wrong. Uh, so, you know, you, you look at all of those um, data to assess the health of, of the organization. And based on that, you have to figure out, you know, what are the problems and how do you solve them? Wow, amazing, amazing. So uh, in your opinion, right, um, who should be the ultimate owner for building the engineering culture in the company? Is it the CTO? Is it the HR team, CEO? What is, what's your opinion? My, uh, my opinion is that everyone own cultures, okay? I maybe, for example, at the company level, uh, our founders at Coupon, as well as the founder at Uber, uh, created the company-wide culture value. So they instigated it, right? They then part their philosophy, which is as, as founder, they should because it's their company, okay? Um, they get to define how that company feels and operated, et cetera, as a philosophy. Uh, as an engineering leader, uh, I do similar things, right? I basically mm -hmm. impart my preferences of how the engineering team culture uh, should feel like on top of the company-wide culture, which is what I shared with, with you just earlier, okay? But then after that, everybody owned the culture because I'm not the only one and I cannot be the one to enforce the culture. If the culture is the collective behavior, all of us ultimately have to believe in it. All of us have mm -hmm. to uh, defend it, have to live those values and have to call each other out when you see violations uh, of, of those values. And I think that is the, the most important thing. Um, I saw your LinkedIn post where, where you, you know, quote me earlier, right? Leadership is about people doing the right thing in yep. your absence. And that culture is exactly the same thing. When you establish mm. the right culture, the right thing just happened. It doesn't matter who's in charge because everyone uh, value that culture. Everybody cares about maintaining that culture, enhance that culture. By the way, culture also morph and change over time. And hopefully as they change, it actually get better and not worse, okay? And mm. so, because um, every, time, every time you bring in a, a new employee, 
that person has a different perspective, okay? But that person, mm -hmm. because you screen it properly, kind of align with your, your values anyway, right? You remember what I shared earlier about interviewing for the cultural fit, uh, cultural alignment. Yeah. And then that person might have some really great insight and approach and method or whatever it is that actually can add to the mix and make the culture richer, make the process a little bit better. Uh, and so if you do it right, the culture continue to, um, to improve and enhance over time. But everybody needs to own culture. Um, this is not the, um, the job of any one person. Mm -hmm. No one can actually do it by themselves. Yes. So uh, talking about uh, screening candidates to align with cultures, um, how do you recruit the top tech talents in the market? Um, uh, I know that in technology, some uh, you know, superstars can be a little bit eccentric. So how do you balance out between talents um, and culture here? And um, more importantly, um, I guess this is a, a very interesting question is that how do you recruit the CTO and the top tech talents? Sure. Um, okay, it's a very nuanced answer, okay? So well, first of all, um, people can be eccentric and it's fine, but it can be a jerk. That's not fine in, in, the, in, mm. the, in any culture that I'm, I'm involved with, okay? Because we all need to work together to get things done. And having people who are abrasive, who are, uh, who are bullying others and stuff like that is just gonna destroy the dynamic and the culture, the, the fabric of the team. And that, that's never acceptable. Um, eccentric is fine, uh, you know? So, but uh, in terms of hiring the top talent, Okay, so the nuance here is um, my answer is actually it depends. Uh, it depends on what stage your company is in. Let's say if you are a very early stage company, uh, you don't have the brand, you don't have any cachet at all, um, you don't have money, uh, it, you're full of risk. People who are top talent at top companies won't. Mm -hmm need to jump out of that company and take all these risks and join a flight by night company and might fall, right? They just don't need to because in their position with their talent, uh, many other company can provide better alternative for them where they can get big pay package without taking that kind of a risk, right? So for a very small company, uh, the first starting out, you have to just hire people who are good enough for that stage of the company. Uh, again, it's being sort of very modest and being very realistic about what you can afford and, uh, and just aim for the kind of talent that, you, that will carry you for a couple of years. And then if the company continue to, to grow, and if those talent continue to grow with the company as they help the company succeed, that's all great, okay? Um, you know, uh, but if, if they don't, you have to make a very, very hard decision to, to, mm -hmm. uh, to swap mm -hmm. and then to up level. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, using my own personal experience, remember that uh, failed startup that I shared with you in my journey. Okay. Yep. So I had to, it has no money, uh, very little money. Uh, and um, to the point where I had to hire my first two engineer by posting job on a community job board. Right, Craigslist, mm. and and the, yes. yeah, I couldn't afford Craigslist. recruiter, couldn't afford anything, and and yet you are able to find some decent engineer in that early stage, and then I was able to pull in a few friends from my network who trust me, who come in because I'm there, and then we all build things together. Uh, the, the company didn't go anywhere, but we learned a ton, and then we all end up you know going to uh, other companies together like VMware. Okay, so that that was you know one one thing. Um, another um, example is. Um, when and by the way, I was able to that company was able to get me back then because I was a nobody, right? I was the one who needed to prove myself. Jumping out of double right. click, I need to prove myself. So I take that risk and because I have something that I, I want to do with that company. So you have to align what the company needs with what the candidate you know um, is motivated uh, to do as well, right? So do you get that? Mm. And um mm. Yeah, but uh, and then at, at Uber, that was another case where I joined when it was very, very small. But by that time, I already had all the knowledge. So even though the company was very small, I walk away from a, a team of uh, nearly 1,000, 800, 900 people into a team of 40 people. It didn't matter. Like mm -hmm. I said, it doesn't matter what position you hold, it's what you do with it. And then as the company gets larger and larger, you still can't able to, to grow and scale and make the right decision, right, for, for the company. So, so, that, uh, so that's how you kind of uh, look at it. Uh, and then um, within the, the context of Uber, I have another uh, example to, to share, which is 
the head of infrastructure uh, at, at Uber at the time. That is a very critical uh, position because if the infrastructure doesn't work and doesn't scale, nothing would be reliable, right? You don't have a service yeah, to offer certainly. the people 24 by mm -hmm. seven uh, all over the world. And, uh, and the company was exploding in terms of growth, okay? Exponential. So, um, and people don't grow at an exponential pace. Doesn't, not, mm -hmm. not even the smartest people. If they are not experienced, if they haven't gone through, it haven't been battle tested, they just can't grow at that pace. And so um, when I came in, I inherit a infrastructure with a leader who was very good at keeping machines running, you know, because yeah. he was an, a DevOps mm -hmm. kind of person. And then very quickly, uh, I realized that if I stick with that person, uh, we're all going to die because that person has no right. knowledge of building infrastructure in terms of infrastructure software to scale uh, the mm -hmm. company, to enable the company to get to the next level of scale. And so as the company was growing very, very quickly, we reached that uh, point where we're all going to die, right? If we don't make changes. So I had to bring mm -hmm. in another infrastructure leader to actually who's very specialized in building infrastructure software. And then that, that uh, uh, no one got fired. So uh, people, that mm -hmm. person went to the side and then did some other job, the new leader comes in. And then that person uh, led the, the, the infrastructure team for about 15 months and started to build really, really good software, but that person lacked the operational skill at scale. Okay, um, so, and then I have to switch that up and bring in another leader, this time from Google. By this time, Google, uh, Uber is already an $18 billion company. It's very, very hot. So it can then attract, mm. you know, the uh, uh, Google level talent, right? Remember the ex early example when you can only afford talent at your stage of, of the development as a company. And then after that, so that person was very, solved a certain set of problem, operational readiness, he was able to do that. But then he lacked the, um, mm. he lacked the, the humility, right? He become too arrogant right. and blah, blah, Got blah, it. all that kind of stuff and cause all kinds of cultural problem. Uh, then that person had to be replaced with a ultimately a VP. Um, and so, so that is the, the, so I ended up having in the span of five years, switch for head of infrastructure. And you just have to make a, wow. um, this passionate decision. I wouldn't call it heartless, but you have a dismass, dispassionate decision where it, mm. it's the right business call, uh, even though you care about all of these people, but the right thing is the right thing. If you don't make that hard choice and that hard switch, uh, the company will get in trouble. And when the company get in trouble, you can't really serve the customer, mm. the business wouldn't grow. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so that that's, the, that's the, the hard part, right? So you have to, um, you have to keep on up, up leveling the talent. And then in terms of you know, hiring the CTO or any tech talent really, um, hire what you can afford at the stage of your company uh, and hire for maybe a two years headroom. And if the person proved to be much more than that, wonderful, right? Then that person can need to grow. If that person mm -hmm. isn't capable and your, your company outgrow that person, it's okay. It's not that person's fault. You know, people tend to not grow that fast anyway, right? And so you just then, if you have the the luxury of being able to grow at, at that pace, then you can afford better talent anyway in in that future. So you just have to make the right mm -hmm. business decision. And be very principled about it. So nice, awesome. So uh, talking about like recruiting and uh, screening for the you know most suitable and relevant candidates at the particular company stage was really insightful. Um, would you share a little bit more to us about uh, how to you know best keep you know the, these top talents to go with you for for a while? Yeah. What yeah. What would be the secret sauce? Sure. Um, the easiest thing to do is ask your yourself. Right. The, everyone member of the audience here asks yourself. What makes you stay at a company? Um, what makes mm. you feel like you want to go to work every single morning? And what makes it hard to put your work down in the evening? What part of the environment create that? And then intuitively create um, you know, that kind of environment. But ultimately, I, I will spell out some of the obvious things for you. Um, one is the impact of the work. All of us, uh, especially when those of us who do you know, high growth, start company, we want to make our time worthwhile. We want to build something really meaningful and impactful. Okay, so and then it's part of the the pride of, of doing that. Right, so that that's that's the number one. Make sure that our work has impact. Their work has impact. Number two, invest in their growth. Everybody loves to have someone else in their corner. 
especially in the entire company, the management chain. If you nurture people, you identify their talent, you grow, you support, you challenge them, you stretch them, you set them up for success one step at a time, one level at a time, they're gonna stick with you for a long time. I have had, uh, I have um, friends, a colleague here with me at Coupon who have worked with me since uh, SGI days and every single wow. company ever since. Uh, and there are multiple of them like that. And so why is that? Why do people stick with each other? Because um, they, there's something they like about it, right? They like the fact that you care, you, know, you develop and you help them, you make the right decision, whatever you, uh, you go, you basically, um, if you have a really great opportunity, you call them up, you offer them those that kind of opportunity, right? And within the company that if you can do that to every extent possible to your employee, uh, they're going to turn around and be very loyal, right? To you as a leader and to the company itself. Uh, third, uh, you, of course, you have to value uh, and, and compensate them for their talent uh, as appropriately. If you can't do it with, um, with cash because it's a startup company, do it with equity uh, and you know, provide incentive for people to align you know, their goals, their interests uh, with the companies as well. But mm -hmm. usually people don't uh, stay or, um, for the money alone. They stay for the other two. They stay for relationship and right. they stay for the ability to make an impact. And of course, if it pays kind of decent uh, and competitive, uh, that's, uh, that's gravy on top. Nice, nice. So um, I'll have one final question before we move on to the open Q&A from the audience. Um, how do you uh, typically manage multiple stakeholders within the organizations, like especially like between management requests versus um, engineering preferences? So how do you settle the final decision that makes everyone happy? <laughs> okay, it's the last phrase that is a problem, right? Um, when you make yeah. tough decision, uh, no one, not everyone is going to be happy. Uh, so and it, it's actually, it, it's a normal and a healthy thing that they're always competing interests. Uh, because mm -hmm. if there is no competing interest, then something is really wrong, actually. Because you don't have, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a clear priority. Uh, you don't know how to um, uh, make uh, decisions and, and wh whatever it is that's going on. You might not have like a, a compelling you know, problem to solve. Uh, with every um, challenges, um, they, they come up because of the, the need to solve something and the constraint that you face. The constraint could be time, resource, and, and talent, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So um, based on that, um, and then throughout the, 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 um, the life of a, success, a journey of a successful company, you have to make many tough decisions right, to, to keep the company succeed. And uh, those decisions, uh, are, are, are hard and they never make everyone happy. And you have to be comfortable with that, right? The, the best way to, to handle this is to actually have strong principle in place and you make decision based on those principles. Um, it, it's much better to be right when you make a business decision and then to be well-liked by everyone, okay? Yeah. So I'm not paid to be, yeah, if I'm doing my job well, a lot of people are gonna like me, but I, my goal in life isn't gonna make 100% of people like me because I'll be pandering to every single one of them and I'm gonna abandon all kinds of principles and I'm gonna make bad decisions, right? Because you can't please everyone in, in, in life. And so, but it's much better to stick to your principle and use those principles to guide you to make the right decision. And so the, the tip that I would have for the audience here is um, in order to make that kind of um, decision is uh, always put the customer in the business first. That is the number one thing, right? Our customers, our boss, if they don't pay, for, to use our services, we have no revenue, we can't pay anybody's salary, none of that will succeed. We, every company exists to serve the customer. So never, never forget that, okay? And as an employee, we put the business and the customer first and, and that we have to solve for that first, right? And so whenever a, a requirement comes in, we have to ask ourselves, why is it important? Why is it important for the business? Why is it important for the company? Before we even mm -hmm. think about whether we can do it or not and what constraint we have, so, right? So that's the number one mm -hmm. thing. Uh, number two, um, then you understand you know, um, what and how things uh, can be done with the constraint of resources and time within the technology organization that I, I talk about, right? But you can talk about the legal organizations or op organization, whatever, it, but everybody gets constrained of you know, resource and time. Um, yeah. And then, but based on that, you basically can figure it out based on the business requirement and the feature requirement, 
what can you really do? And what are the ranges of things you can do that you have to make some trade off? And then mm -hmm. you basically bring those two things together, bring those leaders together, bring those org together, and basically hash it out. Okay, based on what you want here, these are the things we can do. If you don't like it, we can switch this around, but then you give up you know, something else. If you want to accelerate everything in this project, be willing to give up on some other project because mm -hmm. you know, given the, 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 the time that we have, uh, it's too late to hire new people, et cetera, et cetera. And so you have to make that type of negotiation and then you have to make a decision. Now, most of the time, uh, people, reasonable people who prioritize the business and the customer first can use that context to actually settle their differences, right? Because let's see, right. if I have my personal preferences and you have your personal preferences, but if I take a step back and say, well, it's not about what I want, it's about what's great for the customer. Then you mm -hmm. can start to, you know, because you think at a higher level, then you can actually, it's easier for you to make the, uh, the decision where it might not be what you prefer, but it was the right thing, okay? So most of the time, things get resolved that way. And I would always prefer that um, uh, people and leaders under me uh, can make that kind of negotiation trade-off by themselves because that's part of their growth. That's part of their judgment and decision-making process, okay? Now, on rare occasion, uh, they can't do that uh, legitimately that they actually do see things differently and then mm. they can escalate the, to the next level and ultimately up to, to me, other executive to make the decision. But my rule of thumb for escalation is an escalation if done properly is done jointly because of a disagreement, right? So the two parties of that escalation come to the table together with a higher authority to actually hash it out. Uh, escalation should not be done in the, uh, by going around the back of someone to leverage power to get what you want. That, that's the wrong type of escalation that I won't tolerate. When I see that stuff, I basically ding the person and I kick it back anyway. Uh, and because you don't want to condone yeah. that kind of bad behavior that, oh, if I don't get what I want, uh, when I negotiate things with Lynn, I'm going to go to my boss and have that person hammer Lynn to get what I want. And that would destroy trust and that will do terrible things. Um, you know, uh, to, sure. to hurt mm. the, the, the morales and the collaborations uh, of the team. And so, um, and then so when people jointly escalate, uh, then the, the person who has the responsibility to make the final decision uh, ultimately will render, render a decision. And mm. even if you disagree with that decision, you have to disagree and commit yeah. and move forward. The Amazon one. You, yeah. Yes, you, you have to do it because other, and sure, uh, now there, there, there might be, I've never seen it, but there, there might be uh, cases where such a decision violates someone's principle. Mm -hmm. Then in that case, the only recourse is for you to resign and quit and you know, stand on your ground with your principle and, and, and not for that. But if you're within the company, within the context of that, if it's a reasonable trade-off and decision is made, even if it's not um, in your favor, um, you're gonna have to accept the decision, disagree and commit, uh, and then move forward uh, for the sake of the company, for the sake of the customer. And I think that's a very important thing. And now by, by disagree and commit, I don't say I, I disagree and commit verbally and then and go back and undermine the decision, right? You have to get out of, yeah. when you go out of that room, you have to fully agree with that uh, decision, right? It doesn't matter how you personally feel. So um, yeah, and then those things, uh, these things are messy and, and they never make very, everyone happy, very messy. Uh, but they are effective uh, in terms of you know, getting, you to, uh, getting companies to make uh, most of the, the right decision most of the time. Mm. Nice. So I'm sure that you've had a lot of struggles when it comes to managing different uh, people's kind of requirements, requests, and you know, like negotiating or even persuading other uh, C levels as well, as they have a uh, tons of uh, tech requests for this and that to be built, from uh, HR portal to legal operations, right? So let's uh, come towards the. Um, oh, let's open up to the audience. Um, I see a lot of questions here, and uh, actually, one questions from uh, Ang Hui from Holistics uh, stand out here. Um, what are your uh, kind of hard earned mental networks and uh, principles, uh, mental models when it comes to building the engineering organization? Okay, so um, I follow um, a very simple set of uh, principle and at the heart of it 
is that uh, at, at this stage of my career, it, it actually get more and more this way as I get older and, and accomplish more, that uh, I am there uh, to enable everybody else around me, right? The, the job isn't about me. The job is about the mission that we're all in together. I just happen to be the caretaker. Uh, I just happen to be the person who's there to enable the organization. Uh, and so that, that, that sense of uh, being of service, that sense of servant leadership um, is what guide me these days. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough at my life right now where I work for joy, I work for impact, I work for being helpful, I don't work for money mm -hmm. anymore. So I'm not compromising on that, right? Or how I do anything. Mm -hmm. nice. So, nice. Uh, so that, that's very important, okay? And now uh, within, within that, um, there are um, management leadership framework that I developed over the years. Um, and at the, at the top of that is uh, prioritize developing people and organization. Because as you imagine, my epiphany from decades ago at SGI, a single person, doesn't matter at what level, can't do very much. But if you um, develop the organization to have the capability, the cultures, and everything else to align, you can do some really powerful thing. As you saw what was done at VMware's and Uber's and what Coupang has managed to do. It's because of you care to develop people, to develop teams so that function really well, right? So develop uh, people organization is, is a, a, a really important thing. And then beyond that, you have to empower people uh, to mm -hmm. actually uh, 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 grow and, and do the job. You have to trust them. You have to stretch them. You have to all that stuff. Because if you if you do that, they will grow. They will grow. They will have that benefit from joining that company and being with you and working with you. Uh, and they will enjoy um, you know a really good growth path. The company will enjoy their high tenures and and all of that stuff. Right. All the all the goodness will come from that. And then of course you know as as we are in the heart of execution, uh, you. I always say that you, you, as a leader, you are a coach, you're not a player. You're all your, mm -hmm. all your, all your team members, they actually play it. They actually make, you know, day-to-day -day decision. The coach actually make the game plan. The coach might have a, a mm -hmm. vision, okay? And you set it up. And then when, when the players play, you have to trust them to carry the ball. You have to trust them to make decision on the field. Uh, and, uh, and you will help them. You will correct mistakes. You will guide them. Uh, or you and you will praise them, you motivate them, you do all kinds of things, but you are basically, you have to view yourself as, as a coach, right? Now, uh, what happened with, with coaches is that when you win the game, the, the players, you want to get the players to get all the credit. And when you lose, you take responsibility. Maybe it's a bad game plan, maybe whatever it is. You didn't motivate the team enough. And so having that mentality where you are, you are a coach as a leader, and it's not about you, it's about everybody else, uh, is, is very important. And and lastly, um, you know, you, you're there as a resource to advise and, and, and support people, uh, either in your current team or your network of friends or whatever it is, just basically uh, end up being helpful. So all of these things, you know, come back to that one principle of being of service to other people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, these days, there's a nice um, slogan for that. There's a nice concept called servant leadership. But uh, over yes. the decades, I've sort of practiced that, right? How can I Mm -hmm. through the way I do my job, be more as helpful to people as possible. Um, and, uh, and that has proven uh, to be a pretty successful experiment thus far. So, and I'm gonna keep on doing that. Yeah, I can sense that very strongly from you since the moment that we uh, started talking uh, from the very first time, because you were very helpful, very attentive to uh, my questions questions and you gave really great advice for us and you spending a lot of time um, uh, for this talk here today is, is, you know, we really appreciate that as well. That is uh, servant uh, leadership. So uh, moving on to another questions um, from, I suppose, um, this one is for non-technical people moving into management roles in tech companies. Uh, should I learn coding? If so, how deep should I go? What is your take on this? Yeah, um, and I think it, it was uh, captured in part of the answer earlier in my journey of growing from an engineer to uh, a, a, a CTO that you asked earlier. Uh, first, um, you have to take it one step at a time. You can't really skip it because uh, if you shortcut it, you never quite um, develop the skill you need. And at some point, if you get high enough, the deficiency will come back and, and cause you to derail. So I just have to be completely honest. You have to be really patient. Now, you can be very diligent. You can work incredibly hard and grow very fast. Very wonderful, okay? But you can't skip, 
uh, the step. So first yeah. you have to, as a tech lead, you have to develop a uh, technical skill because the one thing in any great tech company wants is it doesn't, I never hire a, a senior tech leader who is a paper pusher, who look at mm. the situation, have no intuition at all mm. and have to depend on their subordinate to make decision. And what good is that person to me? I can't trust that person's judgment, okay? So, mm. but in order for you to have really good intuition to ask the right question, then you have to have done, you have to have the, the fundamental, the engineering fundamental. So as an engineer, you have to uh, spend a fair number of years to do really hard technical work, to be able to function very well as a tech lead where other people, other tech, um, um, talent around you respect your technical judgment and then all of that stuff it's kind of like when when we went to school right all those things that we learn in school never quite apply directly to the job anyway but we learn the fundamentals of how to think and how to solve problems the same way of you know spending time in the early years of your career earning your technical job is to, to develop that intuition to really know that and years later even though you see a, a pattern of a problem the intuition will come back and that will lead you to ask the right question that ultimately get to the right you know, answer. So that's one. And then after that, then you start to step up and you start to have to develop leadership skill, management skill, organizational skill to lead other people, to be responsible for other people. You have to also start to change that mindset. The moment mm -hmm. you become a manager, um, I semi-jokingly tell all of my mentees this, you kind of like um, uh, becoming a, a monk right? Your life is no longer your own. Your success is no longer your own, right? Because you're mm -hmm. there to serve other people from that moment on. Their success has to be pr a priority above your success. Because as a manager, you don't want to be the one succeed at the expense of your, your team. You have mm -hmm. to enable them to succeed. And as a result, you can be viewed as being successful, right? Because that's how you actually scale. And, and then you have to start learning to do that with your direct report. And then when you become the second or third line manager, you have to find out the skill to do that with two, three, four levels down where people can still align, uh, but don't know you anymore and you don't know them anymore, right? That gets harder and harder. Uh, and so, uh, and then, but you have to diligently work and develop those skills for you to eventually get higher and higher in the organization. And if you skip, any one of those things, eventually you will get to the, the, the Peter principle, right? You get to the point where you don't have the skill and then uh, uh, bad things happen. So bad things did happen for the organization that hire you, bad thing, hap bad thing happened to you as well, because you won't succeed and um, yeah, mm -hmm. you might get pushed up. So, so you, have become, you have been a monk for a long time, right? A long time, yes. yes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Awesome. So um, the next question is, uh, what are the opportunities for PMs, um, product managers, to become CTO slash CIO? Um, I think uh, product manager tend to end up being a chief product officer uh, because mm -hmm. they think a lot about product and product direction and product strategies and all of that. Uh, and the CTO tend to be more like technology vision and probably uh, engineering execution, right? So, so that, mm -hmm. uh, that's that. I, I find very rare that a CP, uh, a product person end up being CTO. They can certainly be CIO. Uh, they can certainly be COO. They can certainly be CPO. Uh, but I find pretty rare because the, the technology bent again. If you do the CTO job and a technical challenge comes up, uh, and you don't have the intuition to know what's around the corner, you know, what's the, the mm -hmm. threat that's facing us. Uh, when I came into any company, the first thing I do is I do is operational review to understand the landscape. And based on that, I can have in, develop intuitions about what threats mm -hmm. are facing us, uh, what problems are most urgent to fix. Uh, and if mm -hmm. you don't have, again, the fundamentals in engineering, uh, you don't get to see those things. Because the, the landscape all look fat, uh, flat and, and, and fine to you, right? But if you, you, you look at, uh, but if you're, you know, um, trained and have that kind of intuition in engineering, then, then, you get to, uh, uh, then you get to identify those things and you make good uh, decision and judgment on that. So, uh, so that's what I would encourage people to do, which all grow all the way up. And by the way, it, it's no less important. Again, the size of the team that you, you manage does not matter. It's the impact. You can be a CPO, mm -hmm. a chief product officer, and have amazing product vision that invent wonderful product and the, your company will be incredibly successful. 
and 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 again, it's the impact that that matters a lot. Okay, so, but that's the path that I see. The impact. So, um, so last time we met, right? So, uh, the Uber CPO was there as well. So, how do how does the CTO and the CPO collaborate with each other effectively? Yeah, we are um, professionally best buddies. So uh, he and I sit two desks apart and our uh, meeting rooms are adjacent to each other and we see each other multiple times a day. Uh, and uh, because we have to um, pretty much be two, two in a box. Any uh, business challenge that comes up, the first thing I, I rely on him is his intuitions and his judgment on um, what we need to build based on that business challenge uh, and requirement. And then he depend on me and my engineering team on our judgment on how things ought to be done. Uh, Sometimes we will make a decision to race forward and do something very quickly and accumulate technical debt. That's great, that's fine. Sometimes we say, well, in this kind of situation, we probably need to do it properly, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Or uh, we can still race forward here, but then we have to later on come back and really clean up the mess that we create because we want that speed, whatever right. it is. So the, the, the two of us, uh, work very well together um, to to make that type of a decision, and the buck basically stop with us. It things never need to get to the CEO uh, to 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 mm. break the tie. So um, so mm. it's it's a true tight partnership between uh, the CPO and the CTO. Uh, we we both at the same level. Like I said to uh, to the question before, um, it doesn't matter that you know the engineering team is a lot larger and the PM team is smaller. It doesn't matter. The impacts are the same. We just mm -hmm. um, add different uh, flavors to the soup. So that is super uh, interesting to hear. Uh, since oftentimes uh, in most organizations, um, the PM and the engineering team are often at some a certain level of like they have certain level of clashes when uh, working with each other. So um, you, you do though. I mean, and I think that that um, that push and pull between business and tech. And within tech, between you know PM about what needs to be built and engineering about how things need to be built, that that tension a little bit of push and pull actually forces mm -hmm. to make a balanced decision. Uh, if mm -hmm. engineer rule the day and everything engineering say goes, it might not be the right thing for the product. If product right. rule the day and engineering is just a slave to actually be a code monkey, that would not good. So yeah. it is, uh, it is the, the uh, again, I think we touch on this thing about how do we actually balance this thing. Uh, you know, no one ultimately is always happy. Uh, it's always how to strike the right balance and the right trade off. And that's some amount of tension um, is, is, is necessary. In fact, mm -hmm. my, my buddy, the CPO at Uber and, and me, um, we don't always agree on things at the get go, but we always come out on the same page after we mm. hash things out with our team and and then compromise and then make the right business decision amazing amazing um okay so the next questions um the so no, nowadays tech teams are use so many uh SaaS tools uh that a big task is managing all the vendors tech spend and deciding where to invest in the tools and versus building in-house what is the best way to approach this do you need a specific team for this um, yeah, usually the, the, the infrastructure team uh, is the team that uh, look at all the, the tooling and the technology, open source technology that um, we uh, can use uh, to power the, the company. Uh, and um, there may be so business oriented operational tool that is needed, right, that is pushed on by uh, the operation side, and then you know we, we have to make the right judgment about what tool we need to build. Uh, what and sometimes the the IT department can actually do that as well. For example, if you need a ticketing system, the IT department can actually you know get Jira, whatever, and implement that and roll it out. A lot of uh, business processing tool can can be done with the IT organization. Uh, engineer tend to worry about the kind of tooling for the production and environment. So that is mm -hmm. the division of responsibility. Um, and so, uh, the, the, again, the rule of thumb is you got to understand what stage your, your company is in. Uh, these days, uh, I always favor buying before you build because money you, can, you have, time is very precious. 
uh, money you, right. you have by revenue, by even raising money, whatever it is. And it's, of course, you don't want to be wasteful. Uh, you want to spend the, the right amount of money buying the right tool to save the precious development time that you have to actually build feature for your business that the mm. customer wants. Uh, who wants to build a ticketing system, right? Who wants to build all those things that, uh, that add no value to the business? So use that. Uh, but of course, you have to keep an eye on how to use those tools um, efficiently, okay? So that you don't burn money unnecessarily. Now, um, if your company happened to be um, very fortunate and get really large uh, very fast, um, then some of those tools can be become very uh, expensive. So then at, at that point, then you, at that point, you will have the resources to hire engineer and, and all that stuff in order to customize certain setup tool uh, for yourself. At Uber, we did that uh, quite a bit, actually. For example, uh, no okay. amount of uh, ticketing um, uh, solution actually work for the millions of customers that rise on our system every day because we have right, our certain workflow right. and everything else. So we end up having to build a lot of that stuff ourselves. Um, you know, and um, the, even the, the, the pickup drop-off point, uh, we can't use Google Map you know, very well either because it customized mm. for normal usage. For us, it's very specific to, you know, the driver picking up and, 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 uh, and dropping off passengers about where it's allowed in the city. Okay. We have to know the, inside the city and the, and the point of interest very well. So all of those things, you outgrew whatever the, 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 the stuff that you can buy. And then at that scale, you have to invest in to, to build it yourself in a the, in the better way. So again, you know, going back to that mantra, make it work before you make it scale, before you make it cheap. So first, when you just start out, just make it work. Just buy, you know, leverage open source, do whatever it takes to actually build the business solution you need to sell to your customer. And when you get certain level of success, then you can have the elbow room and the flexibility and the resources to start building some other thing in-house uh, and make that choice uh, slowly and judiciously is my advice. Awesome, awesome. We now have four minutes left um, until the closing. So I would like to ask one final question um, from uh, Charles Lee Coda School. Uh, what are the best books about engineering leadership or company culture that you would uh, recommend to the Vietnam Tech Network here today? Okay, so um, the number one book uh, on my uh, list that I recommend to all my mentees and even my organization here is uh, the, the Multiplier. Is by uh, Liz Wiseman. The multiplier. It's all. It talks about the concept of how, as leader uh, in the organization, their behavior that we exhibit that enhance the collective intelligence of the organization. Uh, you want to be, uh, as I quote the book, a genius maker, uh, not merely the genius yourself. Right. You have to multiply mm. the intelligence of your team. Uh, there, on conversely, there are also traits uh, and behaviors that diminish the intelligence and the capability of the mm. team that demotivate people. And so you gotta, if you read that book uh, and pay attention to it, it become a really good source of reference. And um, over time, if you become aware of those tendency and you minimize your uh, diminishing tendency and then maximize and enhance your, your multiply tendency, you end up um, having a much better, more energetic team. So that's, um, that's, that's a really good book. If I recommend one, one book, that would be that. That, that many more interesting things though, so. How about uh, two other books? So let's make it three. Yeah, so the, another one is actually um, uh, the book by Adam Grant called Give and Take. Uh, that yeah. is a lot about the, the trait of some leader being giver, meaning you are, you are there to enable, to help the, and give it to other. And there are other people who are there to exist to basically absorb and then take things, right? And there are people who in the middle who are called matcher. They, they give some time and they take some time. And uh, it's very interesting dynamic there where uh, being a giver, um, some of the most successful in, the, in people in the world being a very generous giver. And uh, they almost very mm -hmm. altruistic to the point where it doesn't make sense. Why do they do that you know, all the time? Um, and uh, there are some successful people who are takers, but they never achieve long lasting success because eventually people mm -hmm. would abandon them, right? Because you know people would figure that out. Um, and so uh, at the same time, uh, giver also uh, uh, is susceptible to being taken advantage of, right? So how do you become a giver 
in in a in a proper way. So that's actually a really good book to to really dig in. And then uh, the the third one um, would be um, the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni. Or there's a book by also by Lencioni called The Advantage that actually summarize a bunch of his book into one. So if you want to read one book by him, it, the advantage actually capture a lot of these concepts about organizational behaviors and all that. Mm -hmm. And if I throw in the bonus one, which is an important concept that actually have an old book uh, by Hersey, and that is called situational leadership. That's a very important concept too, because right. um, everything in life is situational. Um, for every situation that you face, you have to make decision on the spot based on your judgment of who's capable of doing what, uh, what skill, what knowledge you need, uh, and um, and what resource and time all that you have in order to make the right decision for that situation. So mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, have, having um, the uh, spend the time to learn that concept would actually make help you make smarter decisions. So those are the four I would highly recommend to people. Four books, amazing. So now um, I will give uh, the closing to Ms. Lan Anh Nguyen, so uh, the CEO of Endeavor Vietnam. Uh, Chị Lan Anh. Uh, well, The Give and, Give and Take is also my favorite book. And, oh, and that, that is a culture we are trying to build with Endeavor because we, at Endeavor, the, the key here is the one that success would uh, try to support the one that is coming from behind, like the, the upcoming one. So, and uh, I just want to take a few minutes to, to acknowledge this and for, for joining uh, Vietnam Tech Talent Network and helping us. Uh, you are giving a lot with this talk and everyone, we, uh, we have recording of this uh, session today and we will share later. Um, and uh, a little bit about Vietnam Tech Talent Network we are trying to build a network of tech talents and you would have to be at least a product managers up and still to join the network and to learn from mentor like Anchor. Uh, so in the future, Anchor have agreed to support us. Uh, he, right now he's too busy and he cannot give one-on-one on coaching, but he would uh, support with um, group coaching. And of course, when we can build the network later on, this is a very early day for us to build this network, but we hope that you will join us. Uh, we'll have a link in our website, and then Vietnam. You can come in there and you can register and we will send you later email to let you know that um, our upcoming events and and we together, we build it together because we alone cannot build it and work without all you guys today. Um, so it's wonderful uh, to hear so much insight today, Anh Thuận. Oh, I'm, I'm glad I, I'm able to share this time with, with everyone. Um, I would like to thank all the participants for spending your precious time with us today. So I'm, I'm glad, uh, I hope that you get something valuable out of this, even if just you know one idea, so. Hopefully you see you again. The thing you mentioned in Khan, is that where you learn from and you said that you learn from the friends. And I, I, when I listened to that part, I thought this is what we are trying to do. We are building a network when people can get together and learn, learn from each other. So, yep. uh, so, uh, so that we will please follow us on our channels and our websites and you would get informed of our next events. For now, thanks so much, England, and, and everyone out there, take care. You're welcome. Thank take you. Care. Bye, everyone.